may open up my Dropbox. Um, so let me start really quick. First, it's an honor to be here. Thanks, guys. Um, so what I really want to do today is um, tell you a little bit about my life and hopefully give you guys a little bit of inspiration of how, how you can change your life, really. So, um, and it's crazy because I started a junior college when I was, I was telling her I was about 26 years old. So you'll see the whole situations in my life that took me to a path and, and I, I feel like it's a, been a very good learning path. So again, my name is Tom Holt. Um, currently I'm the owner and CEO of Urbane Cafe. We have uh, eight locations currently. We will be up to 10 um, next year and it's all um, privately owned by myself and part of the bank. So we've done most of it on cash flow uh, because I've grown it uh, organically through cash flow. So hopefully today you guys can walk away a little bit inspired and know that honestly the American dream is still alive. People will tell you that you can't do certain things and it's anything is possible and, and I'll get to that. So anybody remember their first childhood hero? I'll pick anyone. Any, any hero? Roberto Clemente. He was a baseball player. The first Latino that got like gold gloves and was good to recognize this nice player. So. so mine was completely opposite probably. I had this guy. <laughs> Maybe you guys know Evil Knievel. Ever heard of that guy? Yeah. He would, I mean, he's a guy that would, I mean, he had no motorcycle skills at all, and he would just hurl himself on a 400 pound motorcycle. And most of the time, he knew he was going to either die or break something. So for me, that rush of seeing him do that was, was something that I, I liked. So my first real memory was my parents had bought a Honda 50, a little Honda 50. And um, the first time I got on that bike, I just felt something. It was like my passion. I knew what I wanted to do. So the first time I rode it, I was trying to be Evil Knievel and um, doing wheelies. The, he used to wheelie on the seat. So I was five years old and trying to wheelie on the seat. <laughs> totally ate it, and the first thing I remember was pushing the bike back and freaking out that my parents were going to kill me and they were not going to let me ride the motorcycle again. I mean, I was cut up everywhere and all I was worried about, one, was the motorcycle all right, was I going to be able to ride it again, and two, my parents are going to kill me because I ruined it. So my calling, I found it in third grade, I was, I was going to be a professional motorcycle racer. And I would tell my teachers that I was going to be in the magazines, and um, most of my teachers told me to be realistic. Um, I mean, I, I, I always pictured me in the magazines, kissing trophy girls, spraying champagne. Now you don't, there's no trophy girls anymore. It's just monster <laughs> girls. But, um, so, I had a lot of challenges to get to how was I going to be able to be a professional motocross racer. Um, one, my parents were not interested in motorcycles. Um, they, they had probably means to really help me, um, but they weren't interested. So I had to do most of the stuff, and this is where I, I truly learned to be an entrepreneur, is how do you find a way to do things? outside of the box and when you're that young um, it's it's difficult so I ended up luckily my brothers took me to my first race and um, I was winning and I crashed and that happened a lot so um, but the things about racing that really taught me what means throughout business with everything you got to have discipline you gotta have, you gotta be resourceful, resourceful, and you gotta go the extra mile. For example, when I was 12, and my parents weren't interested in this, I had to figure out one: how was I gonna get 
gas for my motorcycle? How was I going to get to the race? I mean, I remember waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning, pushing my bike down to the gas station to get my friends to pick me up on the way to the races. So I sacrificed, I mean, my friends would be out playing and I would be working on my motorcycle or I would be um, going to bed super early so I could race because I was going to be a star, right? Um, it also told me a huge thing about budgeting money. How was I going to, I mean, I was making $20 a week cleaning bikes at the motorcycle shop. How was I going to make that $20 with entry fees, with gas? So I had to really figure out how I was going to do that. So I was lucky I turned professional at the age of 16. Um, and I, I was lucky that I graduated high school. I mean, honestly, if it wasn't for motorcycle magazines, I would not know how to s say welcome. <laughs> so. Um, I learned a lot from that. So, luckily, when I graduated from high school, I was still paying for everything, racing, still going to be a big star. Things were not looking that good. Um, I was in a supercross race in um, Seattle, still paying for everything out of my own pocket. Um, but I got a, a call from uh, a company in Brazil. So they said, hey, we need an American racer to come down here in Brazil. Do you think you'd want to come? I'm like, I'm out. I, I, was, I uh, took the chance and I went down to Brazil and I was going to kiss the trophy girls, right? <laughs> so I, I get there. There's, a, there's an issue w once I get there that they can only have so many Americans on a team. So they're saying, your team's locked up. We don't have a team for you. So I just automatically go into selling mode. Who's the sponsors? Where am I going to get a ride? How am I going to get paid? So luckily, I found a team that picked me up. So now I'm 20. I'm 20 then, and so I am living in Rio, um, penthouse. Cool. So I'm pimping, right? I, I got. I mean, we have a, our own Learjet, and I get to fly all over Brazil, kissing trophy girls and spraying champagne. It was like a dream come true, right? So one of the big things is my dad wasn't a huge supporter, and um, I remember the the first time my dad came out to South America to watch me race. And we were walking down the street, and people would come up and ask for my autograph straight off the street. I was a star throughout the country because I was all in all the magazines, I was on TV, I was hanging out with Pele. So somebody came up and asked for my autograph on the street, and my dad's like, Yes, I know I helped him. <laughs> so that was like my big thing, right? But you know, my dad just passed away, and I think that. His lessons to me were really important, that they created me, and this is a whole different topic, but um, those lessons that, that you have for hard times make you better. So I never look now, back then I was always upset that my parents didn't support me in my racing, but that's what actually made me um, good in business, um, a good family man. Um, so there I am, 22 years old, I'm living the dream. I don't ever picture myself being 45 with a family, right? You think, here and now, this is your life, you're going you're gonna to keep going this way. So I was, um, I was at the biggest race of the year, it was the biggest stadium in the world. There was 150,000 people in this stadium. And um, I was leading the race. And I had a dark patch, and I couldn't see, and I flipped over the bars. And what I remember most was the bike was on top of my head. The, the wheel was spinning right by my eye, wide open. My shoulder, they, when they pulled off the bike, my shoulder was popped all the way through the, the back side of my arm. And you can imagine being in a foreign country where you don't I didn't speak that good of Portuguese, 
and people are pulling you and ripping you apart trying to get your shoulder in and um, my mom had only seen me race two times and both times I ended up in the hospital so that was one of them um, so I ended up getting surgery in South America um, superb hospital though it was very nice it was one of the best <laughs> so um, so here I'm stuck I'm 22 years old what am I going to do? I, don't, I didn't go to college. I, I barely graduated high school, so I'm freaking out going, what am I going to do with my life to, to add meaning? So um, I told some people I was going to go to college. And most of my friends were like laughing, you're crazy. You're going to go to college? You're, by this time, I was 25, 26. I was the oldest person in my class. Um, but I started from the bottom. I mean, what's your bottom math? Probably math nine, or I think it was math nine for me. I started at the very bottom, and just like motorcycle racing, I got all the fundamentals. If you know the fundamentals, I mean, even in business, you know the fundamentals of your business, what's going to make it great? You can make a great business. So um, I used fundamentals and prep, just put every single ounce into it. I mean, I studied constantly, and I had a lot of ground to make up. I mean, to, to make up all that ground. So, um, and I was also resourceful, it just like racing. I, I used tutors, I used whatever I could get my hands on. Um, so I actually graduated with honors from Cal Lutheran I, after um, uh, school. And then, um, so I was going to be a physical therapist. I had seen so many therapists, I figured that's exactly what I wanted to do, is work with athletes, and um, I just happened to um, go by this chain of juice bars. This was years ago, and it was called Juice Stop. It was a franchise. And um, I thought, God, that would be awesome to have my own business. I was telling these doctors when I was working for them in physical therapy that you should bring your business like this. This would be more profitable. And they weren't really listening, so I, I, I did it on my own. And again, I told people, I, I'm going to do this business, and they're like, you're crazy. What? Juice? How's that going to work? And I just, I, so the biggest thing I did when I, I did that was I created a plan. And I think it's important, I, I talk to people all the time that miss this key fundamental step is making a plan for your business. So I, my plan included how many smoothies a day could I do, right, to break even. And the, one of the biggest lessons you'll, you'll hear, do you want to buy yourself a job or do you want to make money? And for me, I didn't want to just buy myself a job, I wanted to make money and, and grow a business. So my first one was 200 smoothies a day. Um, so it was 16 smoothies an hour. So I broke it down. So that first year, um, so I got a loan. I had, luckily I'd saved some money racing. So I um, had bought a house. I was able to take out some equity. You know how that works, right? <laughs> and opened up the first one. My, my brother helped a little bit on that. Um, so I worked in there making smoothies built the fundamentals of the business. I knew how I could operate it. I knew what the labor schedule was going to be. I knew how we could scale it to a certain point. Uh, I got lucky that I knew the geographical area that we were going to develop in. So I knew Ventura, I was born and raised, Camarillo. I knew my niche and my areas that I wanted to develop. So expanded to Camarillo, expanded, or started in Camarillo, expanded to Ventura. Um, then opened another one in Simi Valley, and then I had a mobile trailer. And um, I felt that to really expand my career, I didn't think I was going to get very far in a franchise business, um, as well as it was um, a troubled franchise business, and I was the only one that was doing well. So I ended up selling to Robex Juice, which there's one, I, I had that unit over there on Tapo. Um, so I sold out, made some 
made some money and I, I wanted to do my own concept from scratch. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to own a franchise. I wanted to pick the colors of my walls. I wanted to create the menu. I wanted, I wanted every little piece of that business to reflect of me. So I remember telling some people, I was like, I'm going to open this cafe. We're going to do sandwiches. You're crazy. What are you going to do that for? You know, they just, some people don't understand when you have vision. So I remember I had met my father-in-law the very first time we're sitting down and I had sold my juice bars and my wife introduced us and we're sitting at the table and my wife says, um, yeah, he's going to open a, a cafe. Her dad looks at, looks at her and he goes, crazy gringo. <laughs> so, um, he, had, he had come over from El Salvador and he was working in restaurants his whole life. So he was started as a busboy and, and um, that's a whole different story. But, um, and he's, he's right. I mean, the majority of businesses, you're looking at a 90% failure rate of a lot of restaurants within the first five years. So um, most banks won't loan. I had to beg big landlords to let me get into the location that I knew was going to work. I mean, if I, I put every ounce of my thoughts and, and my manifestation trying to manifest this location into the spot that I knew that we could succeed. And it was a big landlord and they didn't want to lease to me. Finally broke them down and I got that. So. Um, The first one in Ventura I opened up had enough capital that I was able to um, work on the menu. I sat in there for almost a month with a completely filled restaurant working on just menu items. What did I think was going to work in my town? And the biggest thing was I wanted um, the bread oven. It was all about our bread. How are we going to do everything fresh? What's the hook, right? Everybody's always asking you, what is your differentiation? And I, I always think, God, it's really cool to have a big oven where you can see the bread being made, doing everything from scratch in our restaurants. That's what was different from any other sandwich place that we had in our geographical area. So we opened in 2003. We were busy right away. Um, and thank goodness, I mean, we, we made money right away. Our, our goal was, again, I broke it down into how many sandwiches. We needed to do 349 sandwiches, which, um, which was 34 an hour. And we hit that right away. Now um, we rank very high in, in sales per square foot in most of our restaurants, some of the highest volumes and margins in the restaurant business. Um, so, and, and ultimately what we really want in our concepts is to be a gathering place for the community, right? Not just a place where nobody knows you, but a gathering place where you make memories, have, meet friends, and that's where I feel that when, when our concept filtrates into a community, people go there. And they are making friends and families and meeting them there. Um, so, um, and our, our, our goal also is to make you want to come a couple times a week. Our, we're, we want to be a value proposition, not something, somebody that's going to charge a huge amount of money to have you sit down and eat. So, going into like what our goals are, we've always grown as fast as we can grow with human capital. We're, we're not a place that, since it's privately owned by me, it's not one of those places that um, we want to do 500 in a year and franchise out and lose that core culture that we need to have. So, um, so I, I put down what makes me excited about my concept and my restaurant is that after 10 years, I can go into my original restaurant in Ventura, and I
and I still see the people. I made sandwiches there for three years to learn the concept and build the fundamentals, right? And I still see <coughs> my guests, and I remember most of their names. And it, it's cool. I mean, 10 years is a long time, and I've seen a lot of restaurants come and go with that place, and we're busier than ever. So, um, so one question I always ask myself, and I'll, and I'll wrap this up, was I lucky, or is it more? So you always think, am, am I lucky? I always feel like I'm so lucky. I, I, I just got lucky I fell into this, I fell into that. Um, but I also think that there's a common thread with luck. Um, that you've got to be passionate about what you do. I've always, whatever I did, I was in. I mean, I, I, that's all I wanted to do at that time, I, I'm in. Um, you got to build a strong foundation. If you're going to start a business, you, you got to start. You can't just open a business and think, well, somebody else is going to run it. I'm just going to pay for it because you don't learn enough about the business. You got to you got to know every aspect. You got to know how to make the sandwiches, you got to know how to make the bread, and I mean, thank goodness I do. And I, I think discipline is important too. I mean, you really have to buckle down if you're going to do something. Um, you got to be around the right people. You got to find the right people that you want that support you. There's a lot of people in your life that probably don't want you to do better than them. And this is this is a um, you always hope that that's not the case. But there are certain people in your life that don't want you to do better than them. And stick with the people that are happy that you're doing well. Because that's what matters. I mean, friends and family will, if, if they're supporting you, it's, it's a gift and you have to take that. And the, the biggest thing I would say is you have to dream, right? We're in a, we're in a different era of People saying that the American dream's dead, and but if you dream, I mean, everything's anything's possible. I mean, Apple or Google. I mean, there, there's so many examples of people that just went out, dreamed big, and was able to to make it. So I'll wrap this up real quick. So we have a saying in our family that. Um, I ask my kids all the time, if you, and my, my kid always says, believe it, you can achieve it. And I got that from Napoleon Hill, which I recommend all you guys reading Think and Grow Rich. It's a huge influence. I mean, it, when I talk about mentors, I got that off th Think and Grow Rich. So he was one of the first motivational speakers, and if you can do anything. so. Again, we live in a place where, how lucky I am, that the sandwich was created in 1820, right? And I am able to make sandwiches and put food on the table for my kids and have a house and have a, uh, a, a nice life. So I, I honestly believe that whatever you guys want to do, you can do. You just have to... Be disciplined. You got to dream. You got to. You got to be with the right people. So that is it. Are you willing to take any questions? No, that's it. No. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I'm gonna like to. Well, those things, those things, those things. Sure. <laughs> it's funny, I was, uh, I had a, I was at a conference, and you guys know Kiss? Yeah. So, um, G what is it, Gene Simmons? He was, he was speaking, and I said, hey, you want my business card? And I, I, I got up and I was able to speak with him and I got to go and hang out with him. So, and he came into the restaurant. That's pretty cool. So, yeah. Awesome. So you never know when you're going to hit, that thing is going to hit. So.
Can you explain your budgeting process? Sure. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know what? So I'll tell you. So for me, my budgeting process at this current point is way different than it was when I started. I always did things as a break-even analysis, right? So I think when you progress into a more scaled business, you create different budgets. But I think if, if I was to start a business, pick your pick your break-even point, and then scale up from that, from there. Because too many people have this, I mean, I, I could show you spreadsheets of people that wanted to start businesses, and they scaled it way off. Figure out what your bottom line is with, with everything. And if anybody has any questions, I got great spreadsheets on budgeting or performas or any of that that I can send you. So, um, but that's a great question. Is your email on your card? Yes. Okay. And you can always, you can always, and honestly, I mean, you guys are in a business class. If you guys ever have any questions, you can email me. I'm always, I always like to help people um, set up businesses or, or whatever. I mean, I, I think you never know. It's, it's funny, I would go to conferences um, and I would, I would be like, someday I want people to remember who I am and I would be really quiet and things can change. Somebody in here is a rock star. You, you don't know where it's going to come from. So, yeah. Um, so you went into the business by yourself, right? Yes. Why would you say the cons and pros are going into business with a group of peers? Uh, um, I would say a lot of hats, a lot of hands in the, just a lot of people and a lot of, uh, you can, depending on how you structure it and how you communicate is really big. Um, somebody's usually going to take the lead and somebody's going to be upset. So if you do go in a partnership or you do go in together with somebody in a business, even if it's family, you've got to have a contract. Even if it's your family, it's the biggest lesson that I, I could pass. I've, I've seen people that have lost their whole business just with family. And they not only lost their business, they lost their friends. They lost, I mean, with friends and with family. So family and business is very, it's a very touchy area that you can, um, yeah. I, I, if you can do away with it, you're better off getting investors that want to be silent. Um, but again, if you get a contract, you have a great idea, just make sure you sign a contract. Yeah. So you have 11 locations, right? I think it was, we'll, have, we'll have 11 in February. Or 10, 10 in February and 11 in March. I know it's, it's probably far from there, but at some point you do want to go out of state, right? Like in further Yes. Yeah. So Florida our goal is... Um, would be the next state you would probably want to go to San Park. So California is, is a very crowded state. Um, for us, franchising wasn't really an option. Um, but we are more than likely going to bring in a, a strategic private equity company that yeah. scales these things. Um, but my goal is to always maintain majority interest until uh, a certain catalyst happens that pushes me out, or they push me out. <laughs> White bread. White bread. White, white sandwiches. You know what, because I was in my town and I, I was driving around one day and I wanted a sandwich and I wanted a salad together and there was nothing out there like that. <laughs> so, I mean, and that's a, a typical thing, right? I mean, you figure out what what you want, what would work, yeah. So, and something that the masses want, I mean, our concept isn't, we're not going after LA Cool, we want something that's scalable from Texas to, I mean, Ohio. I think our food is is comforting and it's not heavy and you feel good about what you're eating. So that's what will transpire into Ohio or, or all those cold places like Chicago. Quarter Mountain said that your 
that area, the, the casual dining, yeah. the fastest growing yeah. um, part of the restaurant business here. Yeah. I mean, fast casual is, is um, that's what we're in, is is a very, I mean, the, the multiples that they want to loan you money, I mean, I, I could never imagine what, I, I would never have thought my, I, so every day I go into work and I write down, when I go into my office, how much money I want to have. And I write down my goals, what I want to do in my life, how I want to be as a person, how I, I want to uh, be as a, a leader. And every day I write that down, and I've already passed what I wanted to do, so now I just dealt with it. Yeah. <laughs> On to so, so luck. How do you start looking for people to invest? Like, how do you reach out to other people? That's a, that's a good question, because for me, it's different because I have a scalable business. Mm -hmm. um, if you're starting out, you're you're in that gray area where you got a friends and family. It's it can be a little little tough. Can you expand on what scalable is? I'm post that by one of the business instructors in here. Can you expand what that means? Scalable is how can you take something and multiply it and multiply it and multiply it and mul and when some things are not scalable that you can have one and it's just that is a a, a restaurant. Take a mom and pop Italian restaurant. That restaurant is pretty much built on mom and pop. But for us, it's building infrastructure of people, it's building infrastructure and systems and um, training, all of those pieces that you need to. It's almost like franchising, right? But not franchising. So at one point, are you not a small business? Is that a good question? Um, is, is that, isn't those regulations dependent on your number of employees? They say that. I mean, I always think that we're a family business or a small business. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the number would be, but I still feel like we're a small business to, to what we will be um, in five years. I mean, five years we'll have, probably have 60 locations. So. Um, to when you hire management, uh, what do you look for? Um, somebody that's going to show up? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's changed over the years. Before I was, um, we were hiring people that, that they were going to be in that spot for a long time, right? But when you can find and when you're growing to a bigger scale you're going to be able to hire people that can grow with you and to move up so when we talk about like in our restaurants we have it's called a level system or you start out as a salad person and you move up to sandwich and you move up to side salad so you always want to keep people moving and interested in where they're going so when we're looking at managers nowadays, we're looking at, can people go to the next level? We're laughing because I just taught that. Oh, really? We're talking about levels and making people feel motivated with the levels that they can achieve. So that's why I was, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'll tell you all, no business class. <laughs> I shouldn't really tell you that. But, but the good thing is, you guys are luckier than I. I had to learn this on my own of hard knocks. So, um, good, I'm glad I, would I pass? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, everything I taught, you're telling them, thank God. In one word, what would you describe your company as? Like the best word you could describe it? Oh my God, dude, that's a good question. I'm tricked by it, sorry. For, for, me, for me, it's probably different than, than, I mean, I always want our company to be fun. I mean, we're there to make people happy. That's right. So when I come in, that's probably one of the first things I say is, are you guys happy? And, and I want people to genuinely be working for a company that they're happy for. As far as your GM, do you think experience is more better than education? For example, someone going through college and getting like a major in accounting or management, or would you rather have Depends on the position, but I, I mean, it's about mentorship. Uh, ultimately, I mean, 
you have to have a little bit of both. I mean, one, school is discipline. You were able to sit in class and take lessons and, and sit down and show that you were there and present. Um, and I was telling her that you guys have, being older, you guys have a very good opportunity to really absorb this stuff. A lot of kids, when they're younger and they, they, they're not absorbing it, they're just going through the motions. If you guys can take budgeting or learning how to start a business, I mean, take that knowledge and really grasp it, you guys have a huge advantage. I mean, there's, there's most people that, and then there's two different people, right? There's, you're going to have people that are going to work for somebody, and that's okay. You, you want those, and then there's going to be the entrepreneur people that are different. That I'm wired totally different than this guy over here. So am I going to be good at, and I have to look at this realistically for myself, am I going to be good at running a hundred restaurants as, I, as somebody else that's done 500 restaurants? Maybe not. So you figure out, where am I best at? And I know that I'm more than likely best at starting new businesses and doing that. Um, we just gotta have fun too. It's gotta be, it's gotta be fun. What would you say your biggest competition is? Do you compare yourself to them, or do you uh, set goals based on their goals? Yes. Um, so the, the funny thing about us is we started a, way before a lot of these fast casual restaurants did. And because I didn't take investors and I did it um, organically, uh, we there's going to be a lot more competition. Um, and there's a, there's a company, Mendocino Farms in LA, which is a, a great, they do a great job, phenomenal. Our, our business model is different. We're looking after the mass people, and I, I don't know what their business plan is, but um, that's what we're going after is is towns like Ventura or towns like Bakersfield or places that really need people to to eat healthier and not and still feel good and not feel like oh my gosh I'm in that fully green place and you know a place where you can you can go and you still like the food. What was your biggest learning mistake? Jeez, uh, which one? Um, <laughs> I will give you two. One of the biggest one was when I was doing the, the concept analysis of what I wanted to do. I had hired a, a consult a friend to um, help me come up with the name and everything. So we were running out of time. There wasn't enough research, and we came up with this name, Urban Cafe. It was actually Urban Kitchen. The landlords didn't like urban kitchen, so they liked urban cafe, which is funny that a landlord would tell you how to, how to do it. So, um, but I was at their mercy, so it, it didn't matter. I was going to do whatever. Um, so we went with urban cafe, and there are hundreds of urban cafes out there. And they're not very good. Um, so for me, I got, again, this is a stroke of luck, is, they, our first article, they wrote, Urban Cafe, a true urbane eatery. And I didn't know. <laughs> I was like, these guys can't even spell urban right. They're calling it urban. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no idea, so I got the book. I'm like, oh, polite, we're fine. I think maybe I'm going to add an E to that. <laughs> and so what I did was, to be able to trademark it, the, the concept, I, um, we changed the concept and we added an E and it's Urbane Cafe. Most of you guys are probably sitting there going, I just thought it was Urban Cafe. I knew it was Urbane. So now you can say. But it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, nobody noticed that, that one little thing. And that could have, I mean, I was thinking, oh my gosh, do we call it Zippy's Cafe? Or, I mean, I, I really, because if you go on Yelp, we're pretty good on Yelp. But there's some place else that's not good, and if we were Urban Cafe, it wouldn't have been great. 
Last question. We have some a little bit more business to do after this. Oh, have you had mentors? Um, I do now. I have a lot more. But I, I really would tell you guys, get the book, Think and Grow Rich. It's not about getting rich. It's about uh, a, a mindset. It's, it's a mindset of where you put your thoughts is where you're going to go in life. So you so. use uh, self-help books? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's the biggest one. But yeah, I mean, I, no, I'm, I'm, really fan of it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true believer in manifestation of thoughts and energy. I think um, going back to your thought of, of managers, right? So you can have a manager with terrible energy and I've literally seen a restaurant change with the management because of the energy within that store. And it's not just, it's just a whole different thing. And I remember the first, I read this book, um, So Your Life is Waiting, right? It was the first real book like this, and it was about energy. And, and I had Valencia, we opened up in 2008. It was really slow. We had a hard time building it. I read that book, and I, I remember sitting in bed, and I changed my outlook. I go, I would picture people coming in the door, just coming in, and we were making money. But I was just picturing people coming in and opening the door, coming in at the register. It turned in like three months. It was a whole different ballgame. You could feel an energy within that restaurant. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in manifestation. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for your And you guys, I And she, she's going to grab some cards for you guys, so you guys will all get free sandwich cards. <laughs> Having to listen to me for an hour. That was awesome. If you guys don't know, the, the seeming location is probably the nearest one, so you guys should all visit. And you'll see my smiling, happy face there, the cashier register. It's located next to the target on the desk. So that's where we're at, okay? So I'll make sure to get you your, your stuff. Yeah, all right. So everybody's dismissed. Uh, the club members, though, the executives, you guys can sit.